Hi. Uh, I'm Scott. Uh, I'm a geek. Um, I'm a food geek more specifically, but before I dive into my story about how I got to here and, and the work that I'm doing right now, um, I think it's important to call out that being a geek wasn't always a cool thing. Um, I embrace it now, but uh, growing up it, uh, it was difficult. Um, it was not cool to be into the thing that you were into. That was something you got teased for, something you felt like an outsider for. Um, I'm very happy to see that starting to change. Um, and if there's one takeaway that you have from what I'm about to talk about today, it's, it's don't be afraid to be passionate about the things you're passionate about. I work for a company called Modernist Cuisine. Um, uh, I'm the director of applied research there. That means that I take uh, our research insights uh, when we study food and cooking, and I turn those into products and services. I'm also the founder of a blog called Seattle Food Geek, and I'm the co-founder of a new company called Sans Air that's making the world's best looking $199 sous vide immersion circulator. And I'll explain what that is, because it, it's probably gibberish right now. But this is, uh, this is sort of where my story starts. So I've been a, a lifelong geek. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I went to space camp and won an award. Like, that's how geeky um, I was. Uh, and uh, so I studied software. Uh, I went to work for IBM after college, and then I went to go work for Microsoft as a program manager. And I worked on Excel. My, my software history has been in numbers. And while I was working at Microsoft, and working very hard there, I developed this intense passion for food and cooking. Um, my family had always been kind of food oriented. We'd, we'd cook at home. Uh, but I found myself spending basically all of my evening and weekend time cooking. And so I decided, like everybody else recently, I should start a food blog. This is like a, a popular thing to do. And this is what it looked like when it started. It was called Scott's Food Blog. You can tell uh, I put a big marketing company to work on the branding for it. Um, and, and I was making things like this. Um, it, it was simple, and I, I look back on it, and it was kind of embarrassing, but, uh, but I really loved doing it. Um, and when I started, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I thought, well, maybe I should write this stuff down, and, and who knows if it could be valuable later. And I kept doing that, and there were no external rewards attached to this for the longest time. This was something that I just did because I was passionate about it. Now, for those of you who have entered the world of blogging, uh, you know that you face this uh, very Greek story-like temptation when you get to a certain point. All of a sudden, these demons of SEO and ad revenue and whatever come out of the woodwork. And it can be tempting to say, hey, you know, I can make a few bucks from this. I'll put that ad on there. I'll do this thing. Um, and before long, I had a food blog that was getting good traffic and I was starting to generate revenue, but that I wasn't particularly proud of. I kept doing it because I still didn't know the mission that I was on. Um, but it, it looked like this. This is, this is the early days of my food blog. I'm not thrilled with, uh, with any of this work. Um, but looking back, the important thing was that I did work. I can't emphasize this enough in retrospect. Doing work is good. Uh, it's important. Particularly if you're doing work on something that you love and you care about. It's not always clear where that work is leading, um, but it became clear to me later on, and, and I can only say this uh, in retrospect. Now, this, you could call this the sort of 10,000 hour thing. It sounds like a really exhausting amount of time to me, um, uh, but it's something that I love doing, and so I kept doing it. And then one day, I had this transformative experience as you do. I went to a restaurant in Seattle, and I ordered a steak, and it had a little salad of frise, and it had this egg on top of the salad. Now, this egg was different. There, it was unusual. It was unlike any other egg I had ever had before. The yolk was totally creamy and thick and rich, and the whites had this consistency of pudding, um, and it was it was amazing. It, it was totally unreal. It violated some law of physics, and I couldn't wrap my head around it, but I, I had to know more. So I, I asked the server, tell me what's different about this egg. What's this? And he goes, oh, well, this egg was cooked sous vide. And 
I didn't know what that meant. Um, so I, I went home and I devoured all of the research that was available on sous vide cooking. I spelled it wrong the first few times I tried to put it into a search engine, but I, I figured it out later. Now, sous vide is a, a method of cooking that's just starting to become popular in home kitchens, but most restaurant chefs are aware of it, where rather than, let's take steak as an example, if I want to cook my steak to medium rare, rather than put my steak in the really hot environment of a grill or a skillet or an oven or something like that, and then take on the onerous role of human thermostat to remove that steak at exactly the right minute so that the middle is cooked to the temperature I want, sous vide says, no, 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 no. What we're going to do instead is we're going to get a basin of water. We're going to heat the water to the temperature you want that steak to reach. So in the case of medium rare steak, that's about 50 degrees Celsius. Then we'll put the steak in a plastic bag, remove the air, drop it in the water bath, and wait for the temperature inside that steak to equalize. Now this had a lot of appeal to me as an engineer. I've always been the type of person who wanted to be a creative, who wanted to be an artistic, um, but I never had the skills. If you give me a, a pencil and a piece of paper, I can barely draw a stick figure. But if you give me a 3D modeling environment, or if you give me a digital camera and Photoshop, um, I can make really cool work. And it's, it's always been that way for me. Uh, I like structure. I work well having these tools and structures that let me express my ideas. And there was something about sous vide cooking that spoke to me on this level. It says, OK, I don't need to operate like a sculptor perfectly chiseling away little pieces of marble. I can approach cooking like an engineer, and I can apply the, the, my creativity through these structured tools to achieve good results. Now, in the case of eggs, that lets you do things that are really hard to accomplish just as a traditional cook. So this is a, this is a chart from uh, Modernist Cuisine at Home. This shows eggs held at slightly different temperatures uh, for the same amount of time. And I should point out that the temperature range we're looking at here, all the way from the upper left to the bottom right, is on the order of 15 degrees. Um, and you can actually tell the difference between uh, a degree and a half of doneness in an egg. So at this point, I was hooked. There was just one problem. At this time, this was late 2009, if you wanted to cook sous vide at home, you had to buy a $1,200 laboratory immersion circulator if you could get one on eBay that you didn't think had Ebola on it or something like that. Uh, and, and I decided, no, it should not cost that much money to heat water and keep it at one temperature. So for all the fellow geeks in the room, you can kind of anticipate what came next. I reverse engineered it. Um, and I posted instructions on my blog, which I rebranded as Seattle Food Geek, for a $75 DIY version. Now, I really loved making this project. I really loved the results that I got from it. But it was satisfying on a much deeper level because it was an authentic expression of me. I wasn't trying to be Martha Stewart anymore. I didn't care if I ever found an audience for this stuff. I loved it, and that's why I put it out in the world. And it just so happens that other people loved it too, um, that I'm able to directly track. I'm aware of about 1,000 people who've completed this build. So the real number is actually probably quite a bit bigger. And Make Magazine picked up the build and published it. Now, for a geek, that's like achievement unlocked. Like, you get a merit badge for being published in, in Make Magazine. But I, I realized around this time that I had found the right pond. You know, people talk about being a big fish in a small pond or whatever. I think which pond actually matters. Um, uh, and once I adopted this strategy that I was going to make for myself, well, things got better. Things naturally fell into place. So my blog content got better. For example, this is duck prosciutto that I cured in a wine uh, refrigerator that I converted into a curing chamber. Um, this is... Uh, a pickle with electricity applied to it. <laughs> Why? 
because it's really cool. And if you haven't done this experiment, if you, if you plug something with a lot of salt into your household uh, outlet or do it in your hotel room tonight, um, <laughs> it glows orange because the sodium ions, uh, that's the, the energy they give up. And if you think pickles are cool, put two electrodes in a vat of soy sauce and see what happens. That's, that's pretty amazing. Or this. Uh, I call this butterfly shrimp. Um, <laughs> This is uh, laser-cut uh, nori, seaweed paper, that I, that I cut out with a laser. It turns out that the um, uh, hardware prototyping lab at Microsoft, uh, there wasn't a lock on the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or things like this. This is, um, turns out if you put ground-up peas in a centrifuge, which, of course, you pick up at your local lab surplus place, uh, you can extract 3% of their contents that, that we call pea butter that have this unbelievable quality, and then you rain it over French toast and a sous vide egg. Now, I was doing all this stuff because I loved it, um, but I, I found an audience, and, and it turned out that, that there were other people uh, like me out there. Now, finding other people like you and engaging with those people is critically important to expanding your boundaries, to expanding the extents of what you can do. This is an email that I got that was a follow-up from a tweet. It says, hi, Eric, Scott. Eric was another food blogger in Seattle. My name's Jethro. So you, right there, I would normally stop and, and send this to spam. But it was this guy, Jethro, who, who basically said, um, hey, do you know of any, like, molecular gastronomy cooking clubs, if not want to start one. And when, when a guy named Jethro invites you to his house over Twitter, like, it's a good idea to show up. Um, <laughs> and so, so we did. And we did the, we called them culinary jam sessions. The, the theme of jazz has come up a lot in this conference, and that's what we did. There were no rules. It was all improvised. We'd set a theme. Um, we'd go crazy. We would pick somebody's house, because we'd destroy their kitchen that night, um, and produce really incredible work. Now, Eric, uh, the, guy, the other guy in the two line, uh, is now the director of culinary operations for Alinea, um, considered one of the best restaurants in the world. And a few weeks ago, at a session of Jet City Gastrophysics, we uh, came up with a breakthrough and we filed our first patent on a way to make better French fries. Uh, so these things, even though they're just for fun, uh, they, they produce some pretty incredible results. So I also found someone else who was uh, like me. This is Nathan Mirvold, and some of, some of you will recognize him or, or know who he is already. He has, I believe, the most interesting Wikipedia bio of anybody I've ever met. He was a postdoc under Stephen Hawking. He was the first chief technology officer at Microsoft. He digs up T-Rex fossils. He studies penguin shit in the Antarctic. Um, he studies global climate change. He builds lasers to cure malaria. Um, he's a fascinating guy. And I came across this article that was talking about a project called Modernist Cuisine. And Nathan had built a laboratory where he was employing full-time chefs, food scientists, researchers, physicists, everybody, to understand the science of cooking and to document a lot of these techniques that my friends and I had been trying to learn empirically at home. Now, trial and error is an exhausting process, particularly if, if it's what you're doing at nights and on weekends. It's fun. It's so much fun when you make a breakthrough. But for a lot of things, what we wanted was a map. Give us a guide so that we don't have to do the entire process in the dark. And the work that Nathan was doing just blew me away. And then I noticed that this lab was in Bellevue, Washington, right in Seattle's backyard. So uh, after some trying, I got an interview with Nathan to interview him for my blog. And then a few weeks later, um, I got to actually go tour the lab. This is, this is an actual picture from the first time I met Nathan. I wore this stupid grin for like two weeks. Um, uh, and then uh, I took a one week hiatus from um, Microsoft at, at a time when my boss was on vacation so nobody would notice. And I did an internship, uh, a cooking internship at the lab at Modernist Cuisine, and I helped uh, the culinary team prepare a 30-course meal that took uh, about a week to prepare. Uh, and it was the coolest place I had ever been. This lab was my Graceland. This was Willy Wonka's 
you know, chocolate factory. This was at all of those things. I, it was the coolest place I had to be there. So at the end of this internship, I, I went up to Nathan, and I may have had a glass of wine or two at that dinner. And I, I said, dude, you have to hire me. And, and it might have been a little bit intense, or, but I, I, I kind of made it clear that if he didn't hire me, things were going to get awkward, because I would keep showing up. Um, and, uh, and so finally, he did. Now, uh, as director of applied research uh, for modernist cuisine, I have amazing opportunities. I meet the greatest minds in cooking uh, today. I I've, I've get to evangelize our message of modernist cooking and made great contacts. Now, I could have dropped out of Microsoft and tried doing all of this on my own. But there's a problem, is that I'm risk averse. Uh, I hear romantic stories about people who say, I have my dream, I'm gonna sell all my earthly possessions and go follow that dream, and more power to those people, but that's not me. I don't have that risk tolerance. So I took the risks that I could tolerate. I made a transition from Microsoft to um, modernist cuisine. Now, at about that same time, uh, I got enticed back into one more risk that I took recently and that I'm really, really excited about. Back, way back when, you remember when I discovered sous vide cooking, the only machines that were available were $1,200, and I, I thought we could do better. It had occurred to me, as it would any rational person, that maybe there's a business opportunity to, to try to bring this into the home environment. But again, my risk aversion kept me away from that until perhaps the universe just kept beating me over the head with it. I got approached by two PhD students from the University of Washington who said, hey, we built your machine from the instructions online. There's this business plan competition, want to do it? I said, sure, sure, there's no risk, there's nothing to lose. And we did well in the business plan competition. We, we to, to relate to a data point earlier, we placed in the top bracket, but we didn't win. Um, and, uh, uh, and at the same time, these new models of starting a business started to emerge, the crowdsourcing model specifically uh, Kickstarter. And so I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna sell all my earthly possessions and basically you know, put all my money on black and see what happens, um, but we could do this Kickstarter thing. What do we have to lose? We, we don't really have that much money to lose. At worst, I'm risking my reputation and public embarrassment, but I could tolerate that risk. So. We did a Kickstarter, we set our funding goal at $100,000 and we gave ourselves 30 days. We met our funding goal and it looked like this. Uh, this is 13 hours and four minutes after we opened our, our Kickstarter. Uh, then this was two days later and then this was at the end of 30 days. Uh, we had set a new record for food projects getting funded on Kickstarter. So why did this work? This worked because all of that work I had been putting in, not exactly knowing where I was going. I was building the skills that I ended up needing for this project. I learned how to build a personal brand. I learned how to shepherd an existing brand. I made lots of connections and I grew technical skills like how to edit video or build a website or uh, write marketing copy or things like that. But the real reason that I think we were so successful was that I was boldly passionate and I was unafraid to be so. This was something that I loved. It might only appeal to a niche market, but it was an authentic expression of my personal passion. Um, and as far as I can tell, that is the reason that resonated. So, what will my next bold step be? I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Thank you very much.